Welcome everyone to this uh, program organized by Sri Aurobindo Society. Um, good evening if you are joining from the Indian Standard Time and good morning to our guest speaker, Dr. Raj Vedam, who is joining us from US. Um, just a few words about our event for this evening before uh, we hear from Dr. Vedam. So, as you know, um, everybody knows we at Sri Aurobindo Society have been organizing several events and programs to celebrate 150th birth anniversary of Sri Aurobindo and 75th year of India's independence. As part of these celebrations, we've been organizing uh, several programs and we today we start a new series of talks and events under the auspices of Renaissance, which is the monthly journal of Sri Aurobindo Society's Vertical on Indian Culture, Aurobharati. And uh, I have the blessing and the privilege to be the editor of the journal. So a couple of months back, the Renaissance team, we organized a 10 day exhibition titled Bharat Shakti at the Ashram Exhibition House here in Pondicherry, which was quite well received. And we received several requests to take the exhibition outside of Pondicherry. So while we work on those details in the months to come, we thought of going ahead and uh, starting a series of talks that are inspired by several of the key themes which were briefly touched upon in the exhibition content. So this new series that we are launching today is titled Reawakening Bharat Shakti Toward an Indian Renaissance. And um, the, as a first event, we have this talk by our esteemed guest speaker, Dr. Raj Vedam, on a very important topic, the unity of Bharatiya civilization, evidence and issues. Before I invite our guest speaker and I introduce him, let me just share a few um, thoughts that tell us, that remind us how Sri Aurobindo spoke of that inner, the deeper cultural unity of Indian civilization. So in his uh, book, The Renaissance in India and Essays on Indian Culture, uh, we find him writing very clearly and categorically, and I'll quote, in India, at a very early time, the spiritual and cultural unity was made complete and became the very stuff of the life of all this great surge of humanity between the Himalayas and the two seas. The peoples of ancient India were never so much distinct nations sharply divided from each other by a separate political and economic life but as sub peoples of a great spiritual and cultural nation, itself firmly separated physically from other countries by the seas and the mountains and from other nations by its strong sense of difference, its peculiar common religion and culture. Um, coming to the specifics of how, um, you know, the, the whole notion of the whole legend of Aryan Dravidian divide, he spoke again very categorically, very clearly. He refuted that notion, calling the whole thing of, about Aryan invasion as a philological myth. And he said there is no evidence in the Rig Veda. And he has you know, a corpus of writings on uh, Rig Veda and other Vedic legends. And uh, that there is no evidence, evidence um, in the Veda of any such invasion. Um, so our topic, these, are, these were some of the themes that we had touched upon in that exhibition. But our topic today, our talk today by Dr. Raj Vedam will take us deeper into this cultural, deeper unity that is at the base of Indian civilizational march. So it's really my pleasure, great honor to introduce our guest speaker for the day. Um, Dr. Raj Vedam, I, who I said is joining us from US. He's a visiting faculty at the Hindu University of America, US, and also at Arsh Seva Kendram, Coimbatore. Um, He's also on the India Advisory Council of Dharma Civilization Foundation and is the co-founder of Indian History Awareness and Research. He has his doctoral degree in electronic, uh, electrical engineering, sorry, from Oregon State University and has years of multidisciplinary work experience in diverse industries uh, in various sectors and a ton of research and conference papers and patents. But what is of our interest today is his deep research into the 
Indian history, aspects of Indian history and his firm, um, you know, his research that is grounded in his belief that what is required is an evidence-based narrative of Indian history. And there is an urgent need for that to correct the grievously distorted identity and history of Indian civilization. So with that aim, he has um, delivered over 150 talks in various cities in India and the US. He's been invited and to share his findings at some of the highly prestigious and popular platforms. Um, he's also conducted more than a dozen teacher training workshops at uh, Hindu University of America. He regularly offers two courses on the theme of reconstructing Hindu history. And uh, he's also worked on reviewing and correcting school history textbooks in two states in India and in Texas, uh, sorry, in India and in the US. So um, it's really our honor and our privilege that he's joined us today to take up this very important topic as we try and you know, make sense of the inner unity that is there at the core of Indian civilization. So Dr. Vedam, it's all yours. Welcome once again, and please take it up. Thank you, thank you, uh, Beluji. It's a real pleasure and a privilege to be on this platform. So I have, a, let me share my screen. Um, so uh, again, uh, it's a real pleasure and a privilege to be here. Uh, I'm very glad to give this talk. So when Beluji reached out to me and talked about this talk, uh, she said that, yes, we know that you normally talk about the scientific evidence that goes against uh, uh, countering some of the more pervasive narratives out there in the Indian civilization, can we make this all about the unity of the Bharatiya civilization? So, so I apologize in advance that some of this might seem obvious to many of us that yes, there's always there, why do we even need to reiterate some of these things? But sometimes when we shine, uh, rather hold a mirror up to ourselves, we see things that we have not seen in ourselves because our minds have been programmed in a certain way to deal with uh, uh, some of these iniquities. So before I start, Om Shri Guru Bhyo Namaha, our pronouns to our gurus and our teachers, uh, present day and uh, days past. It is on their work that we build uh, our uh, knowledge systems, our thanks to them. So when we talk about the unity of the Indian or the Bharatiya civilization, there is so much over there. It seems like a difficult task to even talk about the kind of similarities that we have. It's a multi-dimensional uh, view of unity of the Indian civilization. So I've chosen to uh, uh, group these things along several headers so that we try to see uh, some of these uh, similarities, uh, which, which, will, which will go a long way towards understanding these are one people, that is it. So if we talk about music itself, now we know that music is a large component of who we are as humans, the way we express ourselves, our moods, our happiness, our sorrow, and all of these things. So we can try to see where is the root of our uh, Bharatiya music, and we see that the roots go all the way back to the Samaveda. From Samaveda on to several Upanishads, on to several other writings, and uh, so on, going all the way to Bharata Muni, and from there on Nati Shastra. So we are seeing evidence of Indian music in several domains. And here is just one paper that is highlighting uh, uh, several citations to music through the ages by various authorities, for example. And uh, Indian music eventually evolved into, did I skip a slide here? No, I did not. Let me, okay. So eventually it evolved into something that we called uh, the Shruti and the octave. The Chandogya Upanishad, for example, it talks of the division of the, of the octave into 22 parts. We are more accustomed to, when we look at the piano keyboard or elsewhere, you got white keys and black keys, seven whole notes or 12 semitones. And, but Indian music is divided into 22 parts. And the Shruti is the smallest interval of a pitch. And Swaras are constructed with uh, in a scale or a raga, seven per octave, Nati Shastra. 
and we see a kind of a division with the very familiar sari gama padani and so on and in india as with everything else every aspect of life is organically connected to the uh, cosmos as the indians envisioned it and saw it there was no distinction of secularity and divinity and so on they saw everything as an integral unity and based on that they even saw music notes associated with various divinities like for example sa with agni ri with brahma and so on and there is evidence for this if you take a look at chandogya upanishad for example this is a max muller translation of the upanishads right over here we see the in samaveda on the seven fold saman 22 syllables and uh, we see evidence of the notes right here in chandogya upanishad which is pretty pretty ancient moving on we can also see evidence of this in the narada upanishad which also mentions the seven distinct notes it talks about the the the, the octave over here the seven whole notes over here now we must note that in the we have a peculiar situation where the western uh, um historians starting with the colonialists and starting with the missionaries and eurocentric uh, um, uh, authors and so on they have tended to see indian history in a certain way to match with their ideologies of 18th 19th century scholarship in europe which meant that a whole lot of antiquity of the indian or the bharatiya civilization was denied by them so they had to see indian history in conformance with their biblical chronology which at that time they believed that god created the world in 4004 bce destroyed the world in noah's flood around 2500 bce and uh, all of humanity is a progeny of noah basically and if in accordance with that racial theory they tended to see indian history also in the same way it's also chronology so every aspect of indian chronology has been distorted and it is carried forward as received wisdom to the present day in our textbooks my talks deal with this all the time so you might like to take a look at them where i have um, uh, several angles of rebuttal to much of the scholarship anyway narada upanishad has been western dated to the 12th century current era because of the references to other dharma shastras what it fails to take cognizance of the fact is that many of the indian works are compendiums of work over multiple generations by a sampradaya so there are additions done over time so one inevitably have to go and look for the earliest uh, um, um, chronological or other evidence to date works anyway uh, we have evidence of music in narada upanishad edition so we are seeing that initially from samaveda from three notes we see that music evolved to five notes and eventually into seven notes and we see that early music today if you want to tune your guitar or your piano you might have a tuning fork or you might have an electronic tuner on your phone and so on early day the reference for these notes was bird or animal sounds for example mars heron ga is like a goat rees like a bull and so on one can imagine immediately in your mind the sound these things make and the, the kind of reference note it was evidence of music is there all over bharat whether you go to northern india southern india eastern india western india we see evidence of music everywhere and as examples i have taken some temple architecture from some of the early ones to the later ones to show this if you look at the pallava a temple architecture in near kanchipuram and we are seeing that uh, from the year 600 to around 800 current era there's evidence in several temple uh, carvings for example here you you have krishna mandapa in mahabalipuram you have a flute shown over here and here you have conch blower in this one and here there's a fretless veena as a resonator kind of uh, uh, instrument that has been played over here and one more fretless veena been played over here some evidence of that and some more temples showing that for example a drone like the thampura that we have today you see that over here one more flute over here uh, from the kailasanatha temple kanchipuram you're seeing a bowed instrument similar to the violin the ravana ratha and so on and the drummer you see a drummer over here and vertical drums these are the two vertical drums over here we see that and going on to the chalukyas the chalukyas were a great empire in karnataka in madhya pradesh in, in maharashtra and these areas so the chalukyas were from around 540 current era onwards and in their carvings too in the temples we find evidence of music i put arrows over here to show 
some kind of cymbal, some kind of hand instruments, some kind of resonators and uh, drums and all these kind of things. So clearly we are seeing evidence of musical orchestras in addition to just music alone. So it's a group of people coming together to create music. More from Chalukya, we are seeing evidence of musical instruments being held over here, drums over here, drums over here, and, and so on. Several, several uh, evidence of music. Going on to the Hoysalas, Hoysalas again, southern India, in Karnataka, you're seeing 1100s to 1300s current era evidence of music over here. There's a Saraswati Veena, we are seeing a Damura kind of a drum over here, intricate uh, uh, carvings, we are seeing these kind of instruments. Some more from Hoysala, we are seeing the veena and a precursor to the violin or a resonator. We are seeing uh, the, these kind of uh, instruments over here. So if you look at the evolution of music itself, we are seeing from ancient to medieval times there's been evolution. For example, we know that this common musical tradition of India from Samaveda through the Upanishads that we saw going on to Bharata Muni's Nati Shastra and so on. This has been there throughout the country for a very, very long time. But in our living memory and going back a few generations, we can pack it back to around the medieval times where we can see Saranga Deva, for example, Sangeeta Ratnakara, 13th century work. Much before any Persian influence, he is listing around 267 ragas in that work. Ragas, like I told you earlier, are collections of notes uh, using which uh, uh, a musician can uh, make compositions following certain rules over there. So we are seeing uh, a common musical tradition from ancient to 13th century, but some small regional variations. Eventually, we are seeing a, a, a small divergence over here in Southern Carnatic music and Northern Hindustani music. Uh, people claim that Northern Hindustani has got Persian and Turkic influences, but to my knowledge, those regions of the world did not have a tradition of music after Islamization. So any music has co-evolved over there with the traditions that have been found in India. And that is what we see. In the Southern Carnatic music tradition, we are seeing Purandara Dasa and the trio of uh, Carnatic music, for example, Thyagaraja, Dikshitar, and Shama Shastri, and so on. And Northern Hindustani music, Jay Deva, we are seeing Mirabai, Tansen, and uh, Raja Mansingh, and Amir Pusharo, and others. In Southern India, it was patronized by the Vijayanagara Empire as well as the Southern Kingdoms in the medieval times. And in Northern India, the Delhi Sultanate and the Mughals. Bottom line, we are seeing a common culture of music using similar roles, similar ragas, and everything spread through the country, everything owing its uh, roots, all the way going back to Samaveda and uh, uh, Nati Shastra. And we see a host of different expressions of music in the variety of instruments present from any part of India that you go. We are seeing instruments that have evolved and used to express themselves in the music in the form that we talked about. All right, that is just one dimension of uh, similarity. Going on to another dimension of uh, similarity, we are seeing common principles and Agama Shastras expressing in Vastu Shastras in the construction of temples in Southern India and Northern India. Now, there are some temple uh, architecture enthusiasts who will uh, try to say that two distinct styles, but the difference masks the commonality between them. So there is a well, thought out, uh, layout, architecture, principles that have been applied both for Northern and Southern Indian temples. I'd like to quickly talk about a common temple uh, heritage over here. If you look at things like this, for example, in Gujarat, the Rani Kiva, 1050 current era construction, what strikes us is the symmetry of the work, that there's enormous symmetry and uh, uh, one can only imagine the kind of engineering that would have gone into making a structure of this form. Tip is almost like an inverted temple going downwards. This is what we're seeing over here. And uh, going on to Brihadishwara in Tanjavur, uh, constructed in 1010 current era, a massive structure that uh, should be on everybody's bucket list. You should go and uh, take a look at this and to see the uh, marvel almost more than thousand years ago, what was constructed. And once again, we are seeing common construction principles, architecture, and, and, and so on. Uh, 
And going on to Elora, Maharashtra. So we looked at uh, southern India. We're going now to western India, Maharashtra, 760 current era. Uh, the rock cut temples over here, amazing structures, amazing structures. One more view of Elora, which shows the beauty of this place. It is an outstanding uh, architecture. Uh, and going on to Karnataka now, Halebit in Karnataka, 1160 current era. This is not a very good picture, but you might still be able to make out these stone uh, pillars over here, which show evidence of turning in a lathe. In, uh, today, if you want to make certain structures, you can uh, uh, turn them in lathes and have a cutting tool to cut the surfaces that you want. And we see some evidence of turning, milling, lathing, uh, lathe, lathe work in, this, in these pillars over here. Amazing to see this in 1160 uh, current era work in uh, Halebu. Going on to southernmost step in Rameshwaram, uh, this is a temple that was built in the 11th century, rebuilt once again in 1750. And we can see the uh, engineering principles applied over here. You see uh, uh, parallel points meeting at infinitely, uh, infinity, typically over here. Amazing. Going on to eastern India, Konarak. Odisha, 1250 current era. Uh, amazing work over here. Once again, the Sun Temple. Uh, uh, if one might wonder how on earth did ancient Indians even build these structures? Is it something like uh, kings would give a, a bag of gold to the maestri and tell him, go build a, a temple, and it takes a chisel and hammer, employ some people, start cutting stones, and they suddenly build this magnificent edifice? No, no, not at all, not at all. It was very, very well planned out even before they start the construction. And the evidence of that is present, for example, the Sun Temple at Konara. In this book by Alice Boner, uh, uh, Professor Arana Ingar is pointing out that uh, she shows palm leaf, palm leaf uh, planning documents, which if laid one below the other, start showing the plan of the temple. In addition to the plan, it is showing a lot of uh, engineering diagrams over here on how these temples had to be constructed into very intricate details, as you can see, including work orders and so on. We see evidence of this also in Bradishwara, where in the walls of Bradishwara, you see uh, a lot of epigraphy that says who built the temple and so on. In many places, we don't have the palm leaves that say how the temple was planned or built. Luckily, over here, we have some uh, remaining, so we can clearly call out uh, 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 the, the, the tradition of temple building over here. Moving on from that, if we take a look at, once again, the theme is one of commonality. That is, a, I highlighted a common architectural principles being used from uh, Agama Shastras as well as from uh, Vastu Shastra throughout the country. Northern India, we don't have many examples. We know why, because of the Mughal and the Delhi Sultanate incursions, we don't have many. Southern India and uh, Central India, we have quite a lot of temples still surviving, and we see what I just pointed out. Like to point out that the Jyotirlinga temples are a prime example of the commonality of culture and temples in India. We have 12 Jyotirlinga shrines uh, throughout the country, uh, all the way from south to the mid part of India, to the northern part of India, eastern part of India, clearly showing a common culture, a culture of practicing Mahadeva Shiva, as well as uh, uh, the same Shiva Puranas, the same uh, stories, the same uh, philosophies uh, used in various parts of India, as well as the temples itself that show that. Just to uh, uh, remind you, the Jyotirlinga refers to a pillar of light that has got no beginning and no end as a metaphor for uh, creation, the creator, and everything, that everything is uh, the, uh, the same. The unity in everything. So that idea is expressed in all of these temples. And we also note that 64 Jyotirlinga temples are mentioned in the Shiva Purana, but we only have 12 uh, surviving today. We know that Gasni, he destroyed Shiva temples in Thaneshwar, and, which is somewhere in Haryana, as well as uh, Somnath. Somnath luckily was rebuilt several times after uh, destruction, repeated destruction by Islamic people. This shows the resilience of the people and the strong belief in the common culture and heritage of Bharat, we see that over here. And hand in hand with this, we also see the Shakti Peet throughout India, as well as Bangladesh, Nepal, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Tibet. We have got several sacred spots that are identified as Shakti Peet, the places where 
uh, Shakti uh, pieces of a body fell and uh, they are revered to the present day as holy sites, sacred sites, sacred places over here. So we see that also. Again, it emphasizes to us a commonality of thinking, culture, uh, beliefs, and so on. In more recent times, we're also seeing the pilgrimage, the chardam. The chardam in its pure form is going from Ramesh, from southern part of India, to the western part in Dwaraka, all the way to the northern part in Bhadrinath, to the east in Puri. And uh, in recent times, we've also seen Adi Shankara, who established matams in various parts of India. Again, the expression is not localized to a certain part of India, but it sees a consciousness that spreads throughout the length and breadth of the country. Once again, showing a strong cultural connect. We see that over here. Okay, we talked about music. We talked about temples. Now we move on to other things. For example, scripts. Are scripts common? Is a grammar common? What about the language itself? These are huge divisory things today that we have got the Aryan languages, we got the Dravidian languages and all of those kind of things. So how how do we unpack many of those uh, statements and where do we go from there? So I'd like to demonstrate from Harappa to Brahmi to Indic scripts, we have a strong connection. So if you look at the material evidence of the Harappa or the Indus script, there are three um, thought processes today the, about what these scripts could represent because people are not being very successful at deciphering what these uh, scripts mean. So Rajesh Rao is pointing out in this talk that there are three hypotheses. The first hypothesis is that it does not encode any language, but it's perhaps like a signboard, like a rebus and uh, picture puzzles and things of this nature. Second hypothesis is that it might encode Sanskrit or uh, Indo-European kind of a language. And the third hypothesis is that it might encode a so-called Dravidian language. So three hypotheses survive to the present day, and you see a strong votaries of each of these things and uh, very, very heated debates going on in academia on, on some of these things. What we can show is there is a relationship between Brahmi to the Indus script. Professor Subhashka, in uh, this publication, 1990, he did a very interesting experiment in terms of frequency of the signs in Brahmi as well as the Harappa scripts, he ordered them, excuse me, let me go on to this one, yes. He ordered the uh, 10 most common Brahmi letters in rank order with percentage, and he showed that these are the 10 most common Brahmi signs, and this is, for example, Sa, Ma, Ta, Na, Pa, Ya, Va, and so on, and also the percentage of its occurrence in uh, several of the texts that he studied. He also took the 10 most common Indus signs from the concordance, Mahadevan uh, concordance, and he showed these uh, Indus signs. If you see this one-on-one, -on -one, you see this U over here is very similar to you with this tail over here. And this looks like an inverted fish from Indus to this inverted fish over here. And this stick figure is an inverted uh, Y over here. And similarly, this to a T and uh, so on. So we are seeing, for example, this D looks like a U with a D over here. This exact symbol is there here too. And the U that you see here is there here. So uh, even eyeballing some of these, we start suspecting there's a similarity from uh, uh, Brahmi to Indus script, uh, uh, sorry, Indus script to Brahmi, and there are several people who are investigating this. For example, this paper in uh, 2012 proposes how the Harappan script might have evolved into the Brahmi script. There are some suggestions on how this might have uh, transformed from this to this. So people are studying these things. If we take a look at Brahmi, why is Brahmi important? Brahmi is our connection to the most ancient periods of India because there's a common link between all the Indian scripts of today. So if we take a look at Brahmi and how it evolved in, uh, in Kannada, we are seeing a clear evolution from Brahmi into from over here into the modern Kannada script that we see over here. Similarly, in Devanagari also, we see similarly, we had the Brahmi script evolving into the Gupta script, going on to the Devanagari script. So clearly, there's an evolution that we can uh, uh, see happening for these scripts. And if you take a look at the modern scripts from Brahmi, we know uh, evolution into Gupta, from Gupta to Nagari, to today's Bengali, Devanagari to Oriya, to the Sharada script, to Gurumukhi, Kadamba to Kannada and to Telugu, 
from Grantha into Tamil, into Malayalam, into Singhala, also going on to uh, on this side to Manipuri, Gujarati, and from here to eastern parts of the world, to Khaima, to Balinese, Javanese, and to Laotian, to Thai, to Mon people, to the Burmese, and so on. So Brahmi is a connection, and we are seeing a common scripts, all of them owing their roots to Brahmi, and eventually perhaps to the Harappan script itself. We are seeing a commonality over here. And we can see the evolution from North and South Brahmi scripts. From here, we are seeing evolution into East Asia, into all of these places through the Cholas and others. And on this side, through the Silk Route and trade, we're seeing to China, to Japan, and so on. Today, there are people who are saying the Japanese, where a script is also influenced by the Tamil script or the Southern Indian script, which came from here. So there are very interesting connections uh, people are making today. But we know that uh, they all owe their roots to a common script culture that evolved in India over a vast period of time. And to hint at this vast period of time, we go to Beit Dwaraka, where you see in marine archaeology in this particular paper, where we're seeing SR Ra, he found a pottery shard in which there is this notation over here. And he referred to this as a Indus to Brahmi transitive inscription in the process of getting transformed into Brahmi, if you will. And he also interpreted that, which could be a moot point over here, how he did that, a sea lord protect is what he said this refers to. And this is datable to around 1500 BCE, showing the antiquity of the script in this part of the world. And other material evidence for script we are seeing in southern India, in archaeology, we are seeing several pottery shards in various parts of Sri Lanka, in, uh, in uh, Tamil Nadu, and so on, where there are Brahmi, what we refer to as Tamil Brahmi, meaning that the language of Tamil is encoded in Brahmi. That's what it means. And we are seeing that uh, in various parts over here. And one of the oldest Brahmi scripts was in Parani uh, in uh, 500 BCE. So this was got when this professor from Pondicherry University excavated a grave and they found a jar in which there was paddy. And because it's a carbon-based entity, they could do some carbon dating and they know the date it came to. And there is clearly uh, evidence of some writing over here. So they're able to uh, do the analysis and also show that Tamil Brahmi is perhaps as old as 500 BCE. And today we have from Adi Chanalu, from Porunthal, from Kodumanal, Parani, and other places, a whole lot of evidence of uh, uh, Brahmi writing in various places. And we can look at the evolution of Tamil itself from Brahmi. On, on the left side, we see the Vattarita. And on the right side, we see modern Tamil going into from Tamil Brahmi to Pallava Grantha, Chola Pallava to Vijayanagar to the modern uh, Tamil itself. We see the script over here. So clear evolution, whether it is in Tamil Nadu or you go all the way to uh, uh, Sharada script in Kashmir or you go somewhere else and you see the script, there's all the common roots go to Brahmi. Once again, pointing to there is no cultural or intellectual isolation of any part of the country, but we are seeing a common uh, intellectual base, cultural base, and uh, as, uh, scholars based from where knowledge has um, uh, percolated to various parts of the country. We also see several non-Harapan references to writing. The, uh, Max Muller, for example, he proposes that writing began what he called as a sutra period. This is again debatable. We see my talks. I, uh, uh, he refers sutra period in 200 BCE, but I'm showing that uh, that is wrong. We, can, uh, we have evidence of much earlier periods. Parini refers to a scribe, a Lipikara, he also refers to Yavanai Lepi, a foreign uh, script, showing he's aware of that also. Manu refers to Lepi and Lekita. Manu's also denouncing forgers of land. In addition to writing, there are also forgers in an early period of time where Manu is denouncing some of them. Yagnivalkya is referring to Manu's laws. I've shown in other works, Yagnivalkya, based on the astronomy contained Shatapata Brahmana, should be dated to around approximately 3000 BCE. That tells you how old that one is. Then you see uh, uh, there is a reference to writing on cotton cloth, copper plates, reference to alphabets that Buddha learned. Strabo, he says, for example, Indians wrote on cotton cloth. Megasthenes is saying Indians had mileposts and road names. For whose benefit? So clearly it was a literate population, right? And so they'd need uh, road names and mileposts and so on. Strabo also says Indians knew writing 4th century BC. 
Arthashastra says that uh, Lippi was a part of instruct in India. It's a very familiar cultural scene uh, known to everybody how Vyasa's uh, recounting the Vedas and others and uh, Ganesha has used his tusk, he's broken off his tusk and he's writing, uh, writing these. So script is one aspect of uh, cultural expression or communication. Another aspect is the language. Language and script are different. We can speak in uh, many languages. We can use the same script to represent the sounds that a language makes. So we'd like to see today there's so much of noise on Aryan languages and Dravidian languages. So we'd like to see who coined this Dravidian separate family and also look for the evidence of uh, uh, Tamil itself. So we are seeing the material evidence. Shulman, David Shulman of Hebrew University, he says that Tamil uh, uh, it can be broken down to Tam, like the, our own sound, Tamil. He also says that the Sanskrit word Dravida refers to Tamil. And there are some people who have proposed an etymology for this. I won't go into that. In Hatigumpa inscriptions in Bhubaneswar, we are seeing it refers to a uh, Tamira Samgata, a, a confederacy of Tamil rulers, 150 B. CE talking about some kingdoms. Amravati inscription, we are seeing a Tamil trader mentioned here. Nagarjuna Konda inscription to Dhamila, and so on. So clearly, there are some references to what could be Tamil in various inscriptions. When the uh, British and the colonialists uh, uh, studied some of these things, their early thinking in 1700s, Carey, Colebrook, Wilkins, they believed that all languages in India are derived from Sanskrit. And you can't fault them for that because they saw so much of similarity in the sounds, the meanings, and the uh, uh, etymology of some of these sounds. So they thought everything was from Sanskrit. However, there was a person called Campbell who lived in uh, Andhra area. He wrote a book called Telugu Grammar in 1860. His intention was to disprove what their assertions were. His mentor was Francis Ellis White, who lived in Tamil Nadu and other places. And with the help of Sanskrit pundits, he had uh, collected a whole lot of word lists of uh, various uh, Dattapata, Patu, and other places, and he tried to show that there were two language families in India. He wrote the foreword to Campbell's book on Telugu grammar, which today has come to be called Dravidian Proof. So he compared Sanskrit word lists from Telugu and uh, the Sanskrit word lists, compared the roots, compared word lists of Kannada, Tamil, Telugu, and showed cognates where they are similar, compared the word lists from the roots of Kannada, Tamil, and so on. And he proposed that there are two language families in India. And this was eagerly embraced by the missionaries, for example, like Giu Robert Caldwell, because these people had wanted to convert Southern Indians into Christianity. And they found that they're so deeply uh, embedded in the Vedic substrate and the thinking and so on, it was impossible to convert them. One way to convert them was to isolate them from the Vedic civilization. If they could do that, then they could convert them. So Robert Caldwell also used the nascent uh, uh, Aryan invasion theories and others that are coming in that particular time frame to propose Brahminical Aryans, to propose that there are two language families, to propose that Southern Indians are subjugated, and so on. So they uh, introduced certain obnoxious uh, 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 um, notions into the discourse at that time, which was embraced by a section of the population and caused problems that persist to the present day because of some of this. But here is where we see the split. And today there's a tendency to study these languages in isolation to the detriment of scholarship in the country. So you see there's a tendency to see proto-South Dravidian, North Dravidian, Central Dravidian, and so on. They study this in isolation to the point where they do mathematical analysis called Bayesian phylogenetic studies in the language families to try to see statistically how ancient are the common, is there a common proto-Dravidian language from which has diverged this huge list of languages we see from Tulu to Telugu over here. And so these are mathematical exercises with certain constraints. The constraint over here is he's not put any Sanskrit or any other uh, Northern Indian language into this mix. If he had done that, perhaps a different kind of result would have evolved. But in, in this particular study, which they reported in uh, 2018 or so, they proposed that there was a proto-Dravidian that was there around uh, uh, 5,000 or 6,000 years ago, it evolved, and from that is where these languages evolved. One has got to be careful. These are based on mathematical assumptions. 
and these are only worth whatever your assumptions are uh, telling you, the constraints you live in those constraints. The, like I said, the assumption here is isolation of southern languages from northern languages. With that assumption, they do this mathematical fitting study, and that's this is what it's revealing. If they had taken also northern languages into this, maybe the answer would be different. Today, we know that India is a linguistic area, what we call a sprack burnt, meaning that this is a place where languages are co-evolved over exceedingly long periods of time. And from genetics, we have some hints of how old that coexistence could be. For example, there are some genetic signatures that say that uh, more than 70,000 years old, 80,000 years old, that's how old uh, modern humans might be. There are some archaeological finds from Tamil Nadu that suggest it could be even more ancient, like uh, 200,000 years old uh, modern human uh, activity in India. So at any rate, there has been a co-evolution of languages for a long time. So that is the way we see languages today. And the evidence for that is staring at us in the face. If you look at the structure of modern day languages, for example, if I want to ask the structure from Tamil, Hindi, Kannada, starting from Sanskrit. In Sanskrit, if I want to ask, what is your name? So Bhavataha Nama Kim. That is the uh, Sanskrit language. In Tamil, we say Unkal Perina. So here there's a one to one correspondence from Bhavataha, Unkal, Nama, Per, Kim, Enna. If you go to Hindi, Aapka Naam Kya Hai, again the same one to one correspondence between these. If you go to Kannada, Nimma Hesereno, again one to one uh, correspondence. If you go to Telugu, Nim Per Empty, once again one to one correspondence. But if you go to English, you see that the structure has changed from what is your name, Enu is what, Nimma is your, Hesaru is name. So you see there is a, a juxtaposition, there is a, a permutation in the way the words are arranged. And from English to Latin, there's a further permutation that has happened over here. So clearly we are seeing that all Indian languages, whether Northern, Southern or so on, they have a similar structure, word structure, the way it's arranged, one-to-one -one, uh, uh, translations preserve the meaning. So that is what we are seeing. And there is more uh, correspondence between Indian languages rather than any Indian language and any European language. There is more differences over there. And we can look at the uh, grammar rules also, what we call a sandhi, when we make uh, compound words out of uh, simpler words. We are uh, seeing that there are rules are the same whether you go to Northern India or Southern India. As an example over here, I've shown uh, if the first word is chitra, which is a picture, the second word is annu, if you combine them, it becomes chitravannu, or you uh, take go, inna, go, vinna, and so on. So we are seeing that these rules are the same. The rules of sandhi are the same. Where we go, Sh again showing the same uh, uh, intellectual base has been used. So, uh, it, so far, talked about music, talked about temples, talked about uh, scripts and uh, language and these things. Now I'm going to even more deeper aspects. What about the DNA? This is a huge minefield today where people are saying, hey, there's a whole lot of difference, Northern Indian, Southern Indian, those people came from Central Asia and all this nonsense. So the question to ask is, are there discernible differences in the Indian DNA today? That is the question. There are many aspects of the DNA question, ancestral DNA question. I'm posing only one. For more details, please see my earlier talks. So this is a paper that came out in BMC Genetics in 2004. And these authors, Kevisil, uh, Metzpalu, and a whole lot of others, they set out to take various genetic samples from parts of India, from West Bengal, Uttar Pradesh, Kerala, other places, sociocultural affiliation and the so-called caste and tribe linguistic in the so-called Indo-European, Dravidic and so on. In the population, who are these people, uh, Jews or mixed caste, what they call Brahmins and so on. And uh, how many numbers of these people exist today and in their sample size, how many? They took 796 samples to uh, uh, represent these 80 million people and make this particular study. And their interest was to look at certain mutations that various people have and see what percentage of the people carry it and what percentage do not have it in the maternal mitochondrial DNA. So these are the various uh, 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 
uh, mutations, if you will, and a percentage, how many people are carrying it. So I have tried to highlight where differences exist for this mutation and this mutation in the tribal population. We are seeing 16% and 7.5, whereas others are in a different ballpark entirely. Again, there is one over here in the Munda people, this particular mutation, 26, which is out of whack with the others over here. In other words, almost every population linguistic category in terms of the mutations that we carry in mtDNA, they are showing similarity with very, very few standing out. And we can talk about why some of those few stand out. Bottom line, it is seeing a common, there's no discernible differences. That is the bottom line over here. One more paper that came out in 2016 in Journal of Human Genetics, that tried to address the question that if there has been a so-called caste system in India with rules of endogamy, then surely over multiple generations, thousands of years, we should see a divergence from one group of people to the other. Is there such an evidence in our genetics? They set out to answer that question using the paternal ancestry, the, the white chromosome from Uttarakhand. And they said it does not imitate the classical caste system of India. These are people like uh, uh, Thangaraj and uh, Gyaneshwar Chobi and others, well-known names today who have studied this. And uh, their result, they are trying to show the numbers, whether it is Brahmin, Kshatriya and others in Uttarakhand, the numbers appear to be the same whether you look at mtDNA, white chromosome, one cannot cluster them saying, this is the Brahmin uh, DNA, this is the Kshatriya DNA, Shudra DNA, such a thing is impossible. That is the bottom line from this particular study. And we are seeing one more study, this came out uh, um, uh, in, in uh, Annals of Human Genetics for looking at Southern tribals, because Southern tribals, they look at the phenotype, their appearance and say, hey, these people appear to be so different. They're closer to Africans than to Indians. So there must be some genetic differences over here. So they went to the Nilagiri Hills in Tamil Nadu and looked at these uh, five so-called Dravidian speaking tribal populations, 24 uh, DNA markers. Their analysis showed that Indian populations are closely related to each other, regardless of their appearance and do not show any affinity to Africans. This is a very emphatic conclusion from, uh, uh, from them. One more paper in Andhra Pradesh, this one studied 27 populations in southern Andhra Pradesh, 948 individuals, and they showed that the average heterozygosity is uniformly high, greater than 0.8. In other words, something called fixation index. How different is one individual population from some other population? is a, a mathematical measure, and they're showing that measure showing whether you take uh, uh, these different people's population, Brahmins, to all these groups they took in different parts of Andhra Pradesh. They are showing that differences are minimal from upper caste to upper caste to uh, upper middle, lower middle, what is the genetic distance. And curiously, we are seeing the distance to the tribal population and the Brahmins, if you will, is smaller than the differences between the lower caste and uh, lower middle class. So the, uh, the, these results are showing that there is no difference. You would have expected that because of endogamy and all these so-called uh, caste structures and other things, there would be a difference. But whether you look in Andhra Pradesh, Nilgiris, all over India, you're not seeing a difference. This is a paper that looked in Karnataka, southwest coast of India. And uh, once again, in their studies, for different uh, uh, SNPs, they try to see these things for these various genes, whether there's a Christian community, Muslims, Thaya, Naya, Bant, Brahmin, again, the numbers do not stand out. They're all very similar. Some people today say, wait a minute, the skin tone, I am so dark and that person is so fair skinned. So surely we are two races in India. It cannot be the same race. And we do see a range of uh, tonal uh, uh, colors in India, from Southern India to Northern India. And this paper addresses some of those things. 2013, it says that there's an allele, which means a certain kind of mutation, SLC24A5, present at the 15th chromosome of the human body. And this is something that evolved around 30,000 years ago in the vicinity of India and Iran. And this mutation is present in Indians as well as Europeans. It controls the expression of melanin. Melanin is uh, something that will uh, define what your skin tone is as a result of exposure to sunlight. Depending on the latitude in which you live, 
you get more radiant energy closer to the equator and less radiant energy as you go to the northern latitudes or more southern latitudes. That is what you're going to see. And that is exactly what we see in India. People living closer to the south, radiant energy is more. The skin takes on a darker tone. And if you go to, uh, towards Himachal Pradesh and so on, uh, the radiant energy is less and you get a different skin tone. So that is what it is. There's no racial difference. It is the everybody has the same allele. It's expressing itself in a different way over here. And this is not just in India. There are people who have studied this all over the world. It is the same. This is the equator over here in the Tropic of Cancer, Capricorn over here. And you see that if you're living closer to the equator, if you have this particular allele, you're going to have a certain tonal color. And if you live further and further away, your uh, tone changes. That's what we're seeing. So it is skin tone is due to that. All right, we looked at very quick look at genetics only for that one aspect, FST, fixation index. Is there differences between uh, modern day uh, uh, Indians that could say that this is one cluster of people who are different from the others? Different studies have shown that is not the case. Whether you take uh, Uttarakhand, Andhra Pradesh, Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, all over India, they're saying that there's a uniformity that is seen in the mathematical measure of fixation index that cannot afford itself to clustering as Brahmins, Kshatriyas, Shudras, or Northern Indians, Southern Indians, such a clustering is not possible. That is the bottom line. Okay, let us look at a completely different commonality over here. We're looking at astronomy, mathematics, medicine. I uh, have not had time to introduce medicine. I wanted to, but not enough time for that. But anyway, look at these things. It's a common uh, knowledge systems throughout the country. We are seeing all over India, the celestial clocks that have been used to mark the passage of time. The sunset, sunrise to sunset, we count the number of muhurtas. From new moon to full moon to new moon, we have something called the nakshatra model. The nakshatra model says uh, 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 how, 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 how many days before the moon comes back to the same backdrop of stars. We also have the phase, the titi model, that talks about how, how many days before the moon comes back to the same phase. We have the uh, uh, Uttrayana, Dakshinayana, which talks about the solar model, the solar year how many days before you go from the solstice to equinoxes back to the solstices, so on. We have synchronies, the synchronized the lunar and the solar calendar with something called Adhikamasa, an insertion of an additional month so that the lunar year comes into synchronism with the solar year. There is an understanding that 12 year cycle of Jupiter, that Jupiter takes 12 years to come back to the same zodiacal plane, it's an understanding of the 30 year cycle of Saturn. Saturn takes 30 years to come back to the same uh, uh, zodiacal plane, or their resonance 12 times 5 or 30 times 2, 60 years, the Samatsara cycle, or the 19 year moon cycle, or the Yuga models and various transits, conjunctions, occultations. These are common knowledge throughout India. Throughout India, the same mechanisms are used. And we can see there are remnants of that even today in the regional calendars that people follow. We have got the Indian calendar, which is a lunar solar or a solar calendar. In the uh, lunar calendar, we can have a month, which is identified by the full moon, which is Purni Amanta, or the new moon, Amanta, which is used in southern part of India, western part of India, northern part of India, solar calendar used in Malayali, Uriya, Tamil, Bengali, and uh, uh, different eras are marked by them, the Vikrama era, Jovian cycle, Kollam, Shaka, Kali, and so on. So we are, we are seeing that uh, in this color code, the blue ones are the lunar calendars based on full moon that is followed in this part of the country. The uh, uh, orange one is Western Amanta, which means the new moon is used to represent the month, lunar month. And the Southern Amanta is the, again, new moon is used to mark this. And this part of India, Eastern and Southern, follow the solar calendar. So we are seeing that as a common knowledge of astronomy that has been harnessed to mark the passage of time using very, very simple uh, uh, notions present in Vedanga Jyotisha and earlier texts that is common throughout the country. That is the bottom line. And if you look at the nakshatra names, the nakshatra names are given the names of the moon's wives. We are told the story of how moon married the 27 daughters of King Daksha. That is the uh, how the Puranic story goes. It's a mnemonic to say that 
Every day in a 24-hour period, the moon traverses 13.3 degrees in the sky. If you take a look at where the moon is today in the sky at, let's say, 8 o'clock at night, and tomorrow at 8 o'clock at night, you see where the moon is, you'll see that it's fallen behind eastwards by around 13.3 degrees. Ancient Indians had observed that, and they had this division of the sky into 27 segments. So 13 and one third into 27 gives you 360 degrees. So they divided the ecliptic into uh, 27 segments. And to remember the segments, they identified a principal brightest star and then named it for one of the wives of the moon. And these names are common throughout India. As you can see over here, you have in uh, Sanskrit names, Telugu names, Kannada names, Hindi, Gujarati, Marathi, and Tamil, Malayalam. And these names are the same. Ashwini is the same. Bharani is the same. Kritika is the same. Uh, Rohini. Where there are differences, I try to highlight it over here. For example, the Ardra Nakshatra is a Thiruvadirai in Tamil, and also in Malayalam is Thiruvadira. And the Ashlesha becomes Ailya. Anuradha becomes Anusham. Jeshta becomes Ketai. So we are seeing regional variations. This is in accordance with a very ancient model. The model is so old that there are regional divergences. That is what it is telling us. If it is a more recent word, the chances are it will have percolated everywhere is the same word used everywhere. But the fact that there are divergences show that it is really an old model. We can see evidence of Rashi in Indian astronomy uh, uh, all over the place. This is from the Airavateshwara temple in uh, Darashiram near Tanjavur. When I went there, I took this picture of the ceiling that shows a Rashi model. The Rashi model is to mark the passage of the sun. It is 30 degree divisions of the ecliptic in the familiar zodiac that we have. In English, you call it Capricorn, Cancer, Gemini, and so on. So this is over here. This is there in the sky, uh, uh, rather in the ceiling over here. And Subhash Kak is pointing out how the 12 Adityas eventually are replaced by the Rashi names. And it's showing that it is not a Greek model or other such things. It is an ancient Indian model. We are also seeing the 60-year uh, Tamil calendar system. If you go to Swami Malai Murugan Temple near Kumbakona, you'll find that on every step, you have one year of the Tamil calendar mentioned over here. So this is a temple that has existed since the Sangam era and is built by the Cholas again, very damaged during the uh, British-French wars in India, 1740. And current temple is rebuilt since then. And every step, like I said, is encoding the 60-year astronomical cycle, which is a, a revolution period of Saturn and Jupiter, 30 times 2, 12 times 5. Both planets come to the same zodiacal plane, and we refer to them by the year. And here is a case where Tamil Nadu is using Sanskrit words. The calendar names are all in Sanskrit. That is used even today to uh, mark these years. Very amazing. If we look at mathematicians, we are seeing ancient medieval mathematicians in every part of the country. From the ancient times, you go to Rajasthan and the Kalibangan and places like that, you see Baudhayana going back to 2900 BC itself. Or you go to central part of India, you see Brahmagupta in Ujjain. Or you go to eastern part of India, Aryabhata in Kusumapura. Or you go to southern part of India, we see Madhava in Kerala. So we are seeing a, a, a heritage of mathematics using citation to earlier and earlier gurus, if you will, acharyas, if you will, that is used throughout the country. The scholarship base is the same. We are seeing that uh, throughout the country. And we also see that if you take a look at the distribution of mathematicians, famous ones that are there all over the country, we only highlighted some of them. We are seeing 5,000 years of innovation in India. Mathematical development was arrested in the north after Islamic invasions and moved to the south under the protection of the Vijayanagara Empire. In southern India, also it died with the onset of colonialism. So we are seeing ancient times, Lagada, Baudhayana, Katyayana, Pingala, and others. The classical period, Aryabhata, Varahamihira, Brahmagupta, Bhaskara, and others who thrived in northern India prior to the invasions around, you see, 1100s and so on. After that, you don't see a mathematical tradition in the north because it's completely destroyed, learning is destroyed there. However, it thrived in the south, if you see under the protection of Vijayanagar, you see Narayana Pandit, Madhava, Parameshwara, Nilakanta Somayaji, Mahendra Suri, so many others until around 17th century. After that, in the onset of colonialism, even that was destroyed in the country. But, but, but 
clearly we are seeing that uh, india had a strong intellectual base which uh, was common throughout the country okay coming towards the end of my talk we see a common culture literature and idiom in the shared heritage of the throughout the country for example at, uh, as an example of the uh, peopling of india if you ask the uh, geneticist where is the origin of uh, modern indian where did it come from they'll say from africa from africa around uh, 75000 years ago you ask the archaeologist he'll say there is evidence in southern india of modern human activity 300000 years ago narmada skull 180000 years ago you go to rajasthan is the activity about uh, 120000 years ago all activity left by modern humans so clearly there has been humans living in india for a long time if you ask the puranas where is the origin of uh, uh, modern day indians it says it is from southern india it says that it is from dravida desha that a king who came to be called vaivasvata manu so he became the manu and his sons were head by ikshvaku they were the ones who uh, uh, led to the population of india this is what we see in the internal evidence and we can see in the matsya purana for example from vaivasvata manu we are seeing the solar dynasty we remember the calendars that we saw some parts of india follow the solar uh, uh, dynasties the solar calendar some parts follow the lunar calendar so this can hark back to these earlier uh dynasties that would have followed different calendrical systems ikshvaku solar and uh, uh, uh vaivasvata manu's daughter ila who married buddha and son of chandra the lunar dynasty over here from ikshvaku these dynasties over here from ila you have the ailas and from the ailas you have various dynasties to the east north south and uh, elsewhere and here for example uh, associating them with a geography you see kashi over here you see northwest frontier outside india in fact over here punjab over here angas of bengal mangas orissa kalingas hasinapura to the north over here magadha to the east mathura to the central part of india and the uh, manwas and many other people southern part of india we see how the puranas are recounting dynasties that are the northern eastern western and southern parts of india if you take a look at the puranas and the uh, itihasas we are seeing that the uh, presence of india is there all parts of india are mentioned in the epics and in the puranas we are and, uh, including parts outside india also this is a map from jesus travi who has marked some of these important places over here and we are seeing that the consciousness of the geography of india is deeply present in the literature of india from the earliest periods of time that is what we are seeing over here there is a cultural continuity of the civilization contrary to the uh, notions pushed in the ncert textbooks and others we are told that there is a periodization from the harappa period about whom we know nothing and isolate after they were destroyed or whatever happened to them we see a break in indian civilization then we see a vedic period then the vedic uh, periodization so uh, uh, archaeologists like bb lal have pooped this whole notion by saying that if you look at the cultural artifacts in uh, harappa you see the yogi the uh, 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 position over here the pashupati seal you see the swastika in monjadaru you see terracotta figurines of women showing evidence of the sindoor which is worn even today by married women Uh, you see the namaste pose namaste is a deeply vedantic thing that says the narayana in me is bowing to the narayana in you that is a vedantic concept what is that doing in moinjadaru you see the shivalinga in uh, uh, in kari bangan and both sr rao and bb lal have uh, recovered many terracotta figurines showing yoga asana positions so uh, bb lal has pointed out that there is no periodization rather there's a cultural continuity that goes all the way from the earliest periods to the later periods a paper came out recently in uh, 2021 in journal of archaeological science where they recovered from a indus archaeological site in rajasthan seven multi nutritional footballs very 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 intriguing somehow these footballs have survived the ravages of time and have survived the desert arid desert i guess to the present time they have analyzed made of moong and uh, other uh, other things it appears to be an offering for some rituals based on other things they found presence of bull figurines copper uh, artifacts harappan seals and so on it's some kind of uh, ritual 
And even today, we have evidence of Pindadana, where we make offerings to ancestors through footballs and so on. So I'm pointing that also out in my post over here, that this is, a, again, a cultural continuity of the civilization and evidence for that. If you take a look at various authors, I've only put some names over here. There are thousands and thousands of authors of various works in India, whether it's an Abhinava Gupta in the north, Adi Shankar in the south, Agatya in the south, or Andal, or uh, Yajna Valkya, Vyasa, and so on. Everybody over here, take them, they have a common uh, set of ideas on the Dharmic civilization. Not one person is saying we are Northern Indians, they are Southern Indians, or there is a big uh, Aryan invasion that came from Central Asia, drove these uh, people to the South and they became Dravidians. Nobody's talking about that. Everybody here is talking about a common base, a common culture, common heritage, common set of philosophical ideas. That is what we are seeing over here. So this is what I call, this is common sense that is staring at us in the face. We know that, but we have chosen to de-emphasize this uh, fact because the Britishers came 200 years ago and told us that you are two people. So since then, we start believing this Aryan, Dravidian nonsense, but the the evidence is staring at anybody who'd care to open their eyes and see where is the reality of that and the internal evidence of the Bharatiya civilization. There is no evidence at all. Then uh, taking a look at the dance forms or the music forms or the food forms or the appearance, the grammar, we talked about that. There is enormous evidence of uh, similarity in various parts of India that we have repeatedly talked about. The foods, like I said, uh, again, uh, dependent on the kind of uh, food grains we see in various parts of India. We see evolutions of foods, but the use of uh, certain spices, curries, regional variations are there, but we still see that uh, there's a common base uh, throughout the country on these things. If you take a look at the festivals being practiced, in January, for example, we are seeing so many similar festivals, whether it's called Thai Pungal in uh, Tamil Nadu, or Makara Shankaranti in Andhra Pradesh, Karnataka, and other places, or Lohri in Punjab, it's the same festival being uh, noted on the solstice. It is a solstice festival being observed throughout India, pan-India. If you go to April, we are seeing things like Vishu in Kerala. We are seeing things like Bihu in Assam or Baisakhi over here. Once again, we're seeing a celebration of the uh, uh, equinox throughout India. If you go to Deepavali, once again, throughout India, we're seeing an observation of festivals. So festivals are our connection to our ancient past, and we're seeing a cultural celebration of who we are as a Bharatiya civilization throughout the country. It is the same. We only call it by different names, so we are lulled into a false city that these are different festivals, but they are the same. If you look at the Puranic accounts they celebrate, these are all uh, the same festivals that we are practicing. Then we see, uh, finally, uh, 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 common philosophies and a common religion uh, throughout India. Uh, to address that, we should first see, uh, uh, address the question, did Tamil exist separate of Sanskrit? Because today, that is one big divisor in India that there is a separate Tamil civilization and the separate Aryan Vedic civilization. This is Professor Shulman from uh, Hebrew University who wrote this book, Tamil. And he examined a number of literary works and he calls out that there is an erasure of Tamil intellectual tradition. It's a tyranny born of linguistic nationalism. He says, excuse me, Shaiva Siddhanta has been distorted as non-Brahmin and as a Dravidian religion. This was done by the British missionaries, educators. They promoted Dravidian, non-Brahmin, non-Sanskrit past. And he concludes that never was a time that Tamil existed independent of Sanskrit. And we have evidence of this all over the Sangam literature, including when the tsunami hit uh, Tamil Nadu, it uncovered several temples in, uh, in, 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 in Mahabalipuram, places like that, where we find evidence of brick temples going back to 200 BCE, showing that at least from 200 BCE, we have material evidence that Hinduism has been followed in all of these parts uh, uh, of India. 
Another person who says similarly is Dr. R. Nagaswamy, who passed away recently, who wrote his book, Tamil Nadu, Land of the Vedas. He was a retired uh, Archaeological Society of India general in Tamil Nadu circle. Again, variety of literary works, epigraphy, he analyzed that and concluded that Vedic practice is deeply ingrained as old as the earliest literary works. And uh, he makes, uh, he goes in great detail into uh, uh, some of these things. Let me hide this uh, control. So he's talking about uh, Tamil poet names going to the uh, Sangam era. Sangam era in Tamil Nadu, the oral tradition says there were three Sangam periods going back almost 10,000 years, which was organized by the Rishi called Agathyar, who came, Agastya came from Northern India to Southern India and brought the Tamil grammar and led to a whole lot of literary works. These literary works are called Sangam periods where poets and writers meet and share their works. And he's saying some of the names that have come to us from the past are names like Gautamuan, Valmiki, Kaushikan, Damodaran, Kapilan, Baranan, Mayakandeyan. What the, all these names are the same as the names we see in the Puranas in the north. So he's calling out the commonality over here in this particular YouTube talk, which I encourage people to see Nagaswami's talk. And uh, going on, it says Vedic kings in the south, they studied the Vedas, Dharma Shastras, and performed many of these uh, Vedic sacrifice yajnas, Hiranyagarbha and uh, Ashwamedha, Rajasuya, and several other uh, practices. And they say the role of Brahmins, the Brahmanas help the kings in judicial, financial activities, and other, other activities. And he's saying that even the philosophy in the south, they followed the four Purusharthas, just like we had Dharma, Artha, Kama, Moksha. These are known by different names in Tamil, but they're exactly the same. Aram, Purul, Inbam, Vid. This is the kind of practices that are followed in Tamil Nadu, which is exactly these uh, notions over here. And he says the marriages. So if you look at the samskaras, samskaras are the practices that we follow. For example, at birth, at uh, death, at marriages, these are all the samskaras that we follow. So he's talking about the marriage. These are almost all of them follow the Vedic right, uh, rituals. And there are uh, uh, eight different kinds of marriages in Dharma Shastras. These are also mentioned in uh, Tamil grammar works. These are also followed over here. And this giving one example in Silapatikaran, this is a famous work that is there in Tamil Nadu that talks about uh, Kannagi and Kovalan. And he's saying that their marriage is described as performed according to the Vedic mantras and going around the yajna. He's talking about this. So clearly, even at the time of Sangam literature, Vedic practices were very much followed in Tamil Nadu. That is what it's telling us. And he's talking about uh, Thiruvalluvar, who's one of the greatest uh, saints in uh, Tamil Nadu, writing on works and grammar and other things. Tapasvi, Sanyasa, he deals with issues like that. The gods that were worshipped, the divinities worshipped in Tamil Nadu, Indra, Varuna, Krishna, Shivan, Murugan, Durga, and others, he's talking about them. Then he's talking about the music and dance. Music and dance in Tamil Nadu, these followed uh, Bartha's Natya Shastra. The famous Tamil grammar, Tolkapiyam, is a derivative of Bharata's Natya Shastra. These are done by a scholar who has spent his entire life working on uh, archaeological artifacts, cultural artifacts, epigraphy, and so on. So his insight is very valuable in some of these things. And this is what he's saying, that in Tamil Nadu, you cannot divorce it from the Vedic civilization. If you go to the earliest periods of time, you're finding it deeply intertwined with the Vedic civilization. And we can take a look at other evidences, Alvars, Nayanars, these are the people who are the earliest Bhakti saints in Southern India, Vishnu, Shiva, worshippers, we're seeing in their works. Agastya, the great unifier who came to the extreme south, today we can identify him with archaeological metaphors in addition to this early time frame. Uh, uh, you can also take a look at yoga. So this is a work by Kanik's Kanikeshwaran, who recently in his documentary strongly advised people to take a look at this. It's called Yoga Darshan, Story of Yoga on YouTube, where he's showing that there's a commonality of yoga throughout the country. In this uh, half an hour documentary shows that. He's saying, for example, Patanjali is revered in several traditions, worshipped in places like Chidambaram. Chidambaram is the place of a Jyotirlinga temple. Over there is the worship. Uh, images of Maharshi Patanjali are seen at various places in India. Then he's talking about the cowherd, the Siddha, Siddha Yogi, which is Thirumalar, Thirumalar, sorry, whose image is taken out in procession every year in Chennai. 
he wrote a work called thirumandiram very important work dedicated to shiva in tamil and he is describing ashtanga yoga ashtanga yoga of patanjali is uh, mentioned over here in uh, in uh, thirumandiram which is a work done over here and is showing how in thirumandiram the eight angas of yoga are described over pranayama pratihara asanas dharana dhyana samadhi all of these things are mentioned over here and he saying thirumular also talks the names of several asanas and spells out the meaning practicing them pranayama great detail is talking about these things so clearly we are seeing even yoga is a bedrock of hinduism today practiced throughout india definitely in the south also so we are seeing commonality i talked about now great great commonality in multiple dimensions music arts temple architecture scholarship dna and everything as philosophy religion we are seeing a common culture the question on your mind then is why is our history distorted we are reading every day that we are different people cobbled together over here by a constitution flag cricket and bollywood that's who we are today and uh, it's a very uneasy tenuous mix of people waiting to divide and uh, break up this is what the west would have us believe this is what indians today are brainwashed to believe also so the question is why did that happen in my talks i talk about it extensively i'm going to end my talk somewhere over here but there's an enforced outsider lens it distorts the bharatiya social dynamics that is what we are seeing and i have talked in my talks repeatedly about this the dis- is connect we talked about the connection now connection and cultural unity in contrast to this we learn about disconnection this disconnect begins in the enforced history i call it that because that's what it is it says indians are aryans and dravidians and tribals and i show in my talks that with evidence these identities are manufactured it says dravidians are separate race i'm showing the identity of dravidians itself is spurious and manufactured it says there are two language families in india however we can show india as a linguistic area where languages coevolved with a lot of sharings borrowings from each other it says dravidian religion is separate from vedic religion we can show these identities are manufactured so who has done this we can see that five frameworks have been imposed on the historiography of india each one came with their own ideology the colonial people when they came to rule india they came to show that indians are backward primitive superstitious stagnant society that requires the white man to civilize them the white man's burden if you will so they came with a certain notion of history and they started distorting the eurocentric people who wanted to show the superiority of the white europeans when they did the linguistic analysis and so on they came with their own set of biases and biblical ideas to try to uh, impose upon indian history and chronology they were followed by the missionaries who wanted to convert indians and so they had their own axe to grind over here they came with a certain set of ideas on chronology on the divisions in the indian society rather than the unions of the indian society the divisions they emphasized that to induce anger because anger through anger they can isolate you and convert you that is how, what has been done throughout the uh, uh, poorer sections of society then the outsider academic bias that we see from uh, the time of nehru onwards down to the present time and the marxist ever since indira gandhi made a pact with the devil in 1972 for political survival they control every academic institution of repute or uh, otherwise today and it is their narrative so history plus ideologies is meant a subversion of identity in india that is what we are seeing and these frameworks like i said colonial people came to uphold the biblical chronology and to show hindus as primitive backward and stagnant eurocentric people to show hindus as backward and stagnant show superiority of white europeans missionaries to uphold the chronology of the bible show hindus as primitive backward stagnant promote christianity and to show class conflicts that all these castes are fighting with each other and all this the conflict model over here and the socialist academy so they came with the notion again to show hindus as primitive backward and stagnant and history from below the so called subaltern studies and so on they promoted a conflict based dynamics of the social dynamics of india where it was oppressor oppressed everything in india was seen through the prism of oppressor oppressed this person is oppressed by that community and that community oppressed this person so the conflict model has been used in the social 
uh, studies over here. And uh, this is again a Marxist model. Karl Marx believed that all of history is a history of class conflicts. And he believed that a day will come through a bloody revolution the uh, working classes will uh, rise and overthrow the ruling classes, and there'll be a classless utopia. So that was a fantasy that the Marxists had, and that is borrowed wholesale by the socialists today who uphold this model of uh, uh, class conflicts, and they show everything in terms of disunity, if you will. That is why we study Indian history and social dynamics the way we do that today. And we have this curious notion of Dravidianism in southern India through people like uh, EVR and others. It's a deracinated framework. They don't actually belong to these uh, uh, frameworks, but they've internalized the nonsense that has been put into their heads, and they go around saying Dravidians are uh, Tamilians who are separate of Aryans. So they also show want to show Hindus or Vedic as primitive, backward, stagnant. They are uh, joined at the hip with uh, Dravidian Christians. They promote Christianity, and they also want to show class conflicts, how the so-called Dravidian is oppressed by the Brahminical Aryans and these kind of things. So this is the impact we see to the present day. And this narrative has meant, has come about because of this Aryan invasion, the so-called Aryan invasion that happened in 1500 BCE, where these nomads, illiterate nomads who didn't have a script, they came from Central Asia and they destroyed the superior Harappa civilization, Indus Valley civilization. They destroyed them. And India had to wait for 1000 years because these illiterate, uncivilized Vedic people were running around in India. Uh, uh, with their cow worship and all this nonsense, till Magadha, which is eastern part of India, they made contact with the Greeks in 300 BC or so. After that, suddenly India got the Brahmi script, they became civilized and so on. So this is the narration out there, India to wait for 1000 years of civilization. And then they say, if you have superior knowledge in mathematics, astronomy, medicine, they say, how is it possible? You're an illiterate people. You only became civilized in 300 BC. There is not enough gestation time for you to have learned this. Therefore, if there is evidence of superior knowledge in your country, you must have learned from the Greeks, the Babylonians, the Chinese, all these older and superior civilizations. That is a narration thrust on you today, unfortunately. And we have this cartoonish image where they say uh, Aryans came from Central Asia, they brought Sanskrit. Aramiak was the source for Brahmi that came from the Levant into India. They say astronomy came from the Babylon into India. Mathematics and sciences came from the ancient Greeks into India. Turkic Muslims got his culture, cuisine, architecture, music, and civilization. The British thought his science, technology, and rational thought. And Bhakti was thought to us by St. Thomas, who came to India, and he thought his Bhakti. So it is a denial of agency in history that has led to a gross criminal distortion of identity and growing divisive forces on spurious ideologies. So in my talks, I show the spuriousness of this that today we have a quest for identity and people are mapping these spurious identities. Some people take on religious identities, the so-called caste identity or the so-called Dravidian identity or a regional identity or a language identity, or some people say they're world citizens, corporate citizens and all, I'm, uh, I don't have any identity, I'm a world citizen, all this nonsense, because we don't have a healthy appreciation of our civilization. We cannot connect to our past to the glorious civilization that we have because of these five frameworks that have brainwashed us over the last 200 years. So to deconstruct this, I have several talks on YouTube. I have shown this extensively. No evidence of Aryan invasion in archaeology, no evidence in literature, no evidence in genetics. There is no Harappa Vedic periodization. The astronomy artifacts in archaeoastronomy, they greatly predate the so-called Aryan invasion of 1500 BCE. The Saraswati rivers observed in Vedic literature prior to the Aryan invasion theory. Archaeology shows great antiquity throughout India. So do see my talks on YouTube by searching for my name. I talk about this. I also offer two courses at uh, Hindu University of America. One course is starting on July 17th. So if you go to the website, Hindu University of America, and search for my name, you'll see the course where I show this over a, a 10 lecture uh, course of two hours each, 20 hours of discussion on uh, some of these things. In conclusion, we have talked about uh, common musical culture throughout India, Samaveda, Bharatamuni, Karnataka, Hindustani, common arts. 
literature of Mahabharata, Ramayana, we did not talk much about this, Vedas, dance forms, temple architecture, common script, Harappa to Brahmi to modern, common DNA, there is no discriminator for Varna or North-South, common astronomy, nakshatra model, common medicine, we didn't have time to talk about this, common math, Baudhayana to Madhava, common culture, foods, festival, dresses, idioms, religion, Sanatana Dharma, philosophy, Darshana, Zalvas, Nayanas, Bhakti, Yoga, so the deep history of India that is taught in schools and universities is wrong. And I've called out the culprits over here, the five frameworks enforcing their ideology and frameworks, controlling historiography of India, colonial, Eurocentric, missionary, socialist academia, and Marxist. With that, I've come to the end of my talk. So you can follow my talks on YouTube by searching for my name. You can reach out to me at rajvedanyahoo.com, follow me on Twitter, or follow my works on uh, Facebook. So thank you very much. I will uh, stop over here.